Amen. Well, welcome back. Uh, we are getting into lesson four, fighting to dominate. Uh, one of the questions that came up was about procedure. And I just want to remind you that I, I'm putting many things on the slides. Uh, the things that you need to really concentrate on are the ones that are highlighted in red. They are underlined. They are bold in red. I give you a lot of information in this course. Uh, you, you aren't, the test is going to be um, fair. And so I'm not just going to quickly say something and then bam, it's going to be on the test. Uh, you will either find it um, in, in what you have to like write down or you'll find it in the notes or you'll find it in the book. You'll have to do some research. I'm not saying my tests are easy. I've got three degrees. So um, and one of them is a doctorate from a you know, full-fledged university. So it, they aren't necessarily easy, but they are fair. And so if you look for it, you will find it. Okay, want to um, look at a couple of wonderful cartoons. Um, this is called Eighth Theist Convention. And uh, the flea says, what proof do we have that there is a dog? Okay, <laughs> and they are standing on the dog. Um, ding, ding, ding. And then basically, it's a 10-step program, Moses <laughs> said. So it's kind of the way it is. Okay, in your notes there, former Muslim and jihadist uh, Dr. Tofik Hamid was transformed by the love of Jesus. Somebody was talking about that before the class began tonight, that, that it's the love of Christ that changes so many people's lives. Um, goes on, so now he wants to teach other Muslims about the love of Jesus Christ. He says the greatest problem in the Muslim world today is that they do not have the love in their hearts. The only way for any of us to really know love is to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, because he is love. And so we will actually talk about that a little bit later on. But um, so peace for who? Peace for who? When we talk about Islam, who's it really talking about? Peace for who? Uh, looking at the notes there, the word Islam uh, etymologically rela is related to salam, which means peace. And those sympathetic to Islam often recast its history in a sympathetic light. They imply that Muhammad wanted peace, yet this kind of peace uh, seemed to be reserved only for those who uh, followed his will. And letter B, he was a charismatic individual, but he constantly struggled with those around him. As, he, as, he went, as it went with Ishmael, so Muhammad's hand was against everyone around him, and every man's hand was against him, so to speak. When he died about two years after conquering Mecca, uh, peace had not yet truly been achieved, even in the Saudi Arabia Peninsula. Uh, the wild spirit lived on in a new militant uh, leaders of that religion as, as it emerged. Now, if you kind of look at the worldview of Islam, you see this word Dar al-Harb. Can you say that? Dar al-Harb. Uh, Dar al-Harb. Say it again. Dar al-Harb. Okay. Muslims from Islam's earliest days were bound by the Prophet's president to wage jihad, holy war, to promote the faith. The very name given to the non-Islamic world was Dar al-Harb, uh, the domain of war. So uh, we'll go over this several times, but I want because I want you to get it down. Every thought, everything inside of Islam was called House of Peace. Everything outside of Islam was called House of War. I'm, I want you to really understand this because this comes into the mindset of, of a Muslim. They grow up in this mindset. Everything inside is House of Peace. Everything outside is Dar al Harb. And so it's important to understand that contrast. Um, so the Islamic polemic approach, the formula was Islam, you accept Islam, or you give tribute to Islam, or you die by the sword. Um, the sword being reserved for those who refuse to cooperate and pay the appropriate taxes. So if they came into a region and they, and they took over, and if a person would not commit to uh, submit, I should say, to Islam and become a Muslim, then they were required to pay really hefty taxes if they wanted to continue to live in that society. And by the way, Islam did not just allow anybody to live in their societies. Um, Zoroastrianism, which hardly exists anymore today, only has like I think roughly 100,000 people in the world, uh, is almost, was almost extinguished by Islam because they would just put them to death. So it was like convert to Islam or die. So they didn't even have the opportunity simply to pay hefty taxes. That would have been more for the, for the Christians and the Jews. 
Uh, those who did convert to Islam lived tax-free. Um, one um, example of the Islamic approach that, that where there was like forced tribute um, happened in the South Arabian Christians uh, or to the South Arabian Christians of the Nejran who had to submit to Muhammad, but um, they also had to pay a tribute of 2,000 garments each. Think about how many 2,000 garments is, like 2,000 2, sets of clothes, wow. Um, each worth at least an ounce of silver in order to enjoy the prophet's protection. So really hefty there. At the bottom of the page, whatever peace Muhammad gained, however, it certainly wasn't peace for the Jews who were driven from their homes during his, his reign in Medina or for those who were slaughtered by the sword. After he conquered Mecca, it is true that large numbers of Arab tribes sent emissaries to him and accepted his religion of Islam, but it is equally true that others submitted only after military pressure. It was only true, uh, it was also true that he forced those who would not become Muslims to submit to Islamic law and to pay taxes that Muslims did not have to pay. All right, uh, moving on. Um, oh, I did want to point this out to you. So here is a map of the pre-Islamic tribes in Arabia from approximately 600 uh, going up to the time of Muhammad. And I know this is a small map, but in the very top there, there's like crosses, very small blue crosses. Those are actually Christian tribes that were in that region of Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula, it was called at that time. It actually wasn't called Saudi Arabia until um, King, you know, the, the Saud family took over several hundred years ago. Um, and then down here, Najran is, is a Christian community. Uh, the Jewish communities are there. They're kind of hard to see. They're light blue. They're with the stars of David. Uh, Medina had been one, and Kaibar. And so basically, um, you know, when he took over at that time, you had these communities. Now, there were others that were pagan communities, and they basically just came to Muhammad and said, okay, we, we want to become Muslims, uh, many of them under the reign of Muhammad. Now, the first four caliphs, um, the word cal caliphate means rightly, or excuse me, the word Rashidun, which was the first uh, caliphate, if you will, meant rightly guided. And so what we're going to look at is, is kind of the first caliphate, the first four caliphs that were a part of this caliphate. Uh, Muhammad, as was mentioned before, had no sons that lived. His, his, his boys all died when they were little, and he only had daughters that lived. He had four daughters that lived, and they didn't live all that long, but you know, back in those days, people didn't necessarily live all that long anyway. Uh, some of them lived into their... Uh, late 20s or early 30s, and, and I believe that two of them had children, if I remember that correctly. Certainly Fatima had children, and so usually the line of succession comes down through Fatima in, um, for the Shiites. But you look at the timeline of the four caliphs, there was Abu Bakr from 632 to 634, Umar from 634 to 644, Uthman from 644 to 656, that's 12 years, and then Ali from 656 to 661. Now, I want to look um, just uh, a little bit at each one of their lives to give you a little bit of an idea of what the very first caliphs or the, very, or the first caliphate actually looked like. And so we begin with um, Abu Bakr, and he was uh, the first man to accept Islam. He was two years younger than Muhammad, and al Sadig uh, means true believing person. So that was an honorary title given to him, which meant that, you know, because he was one of the first to convert and he was, he was just always right there with Muhammad, he was called al Sadig. He was the father-in-law uh, of Muhammad because he was the father of Asia, which um, remember that um, his, his first wife was his only wife, but then when he started marrying after she passed away, after Khadijah passed away. He had multiple wives. Well, one of them was Aisha, and she was the daughter of Abu Bakr, and she was actually given to Muhammad when she was six years old, which in our culture we just can't even comprehend such a thing. 
Um, and then Muhammad consummated the marriage when she was only eight or nine years old. Um, she became his favorite wife at the time. Um, now, Caliph Abu Bakr is actually shown in the Quran. Uh, we read about him in Surah 940. And this, uh, it says, uh, Surah 940, by the way, in your notes there, please change that to Surah 940. That was a typo. Uh, he was a companion with Muhammad in the cave. That's under uh, letter D there. Um, should say Surah 940. So he was with Muhammad in the cave. And um, the slide says the companion with Muhammad in the cave in Jabal Thar as they hid from a Meccan search party. So this would have happened during one of the uh, strifes between Mecca and Medina, one of the m m wars. I don't know if it was a major war, if it was one of the minor wars, but it happened sometime in there. And then the surah part of it goes like this. Even if you do not help the prophet, God helped him when, this, when the disbelievers drove him out. When the two of them were in the cave, um, he, meaning Muhammad, said to his companion, meaning Abu Bakr, do not worry, God is with us, and God sent his calm down to him, aided him with forces invisible to you, and brought down the disbeliever's plan. God's plan is higher, God is almighty and wise. And so um, he was also known for um, being generous because he funded Muhammad's battles. Now, under uh, letter F, you see the Ridda Wars, and these were the wars of apostasy, because what happened was uh, people came together underneath Muhammad, uh, but then when Muhammad died, it's like, okay, well, we were a part of that, but now it's over. Well, Abu Bakr went to war with them because he was saying that they were following, falling away. Well, basically, they were saying, well, we, we serve Muhammad, but who are you? Why should we serve you? And so he went to war with them, and you can see in the green area on the map, that's where a lot of the war took place in that part of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And then on his deathbed, he nominated Umar as the new caliph. Now, Umar is spelled different ways. Uh, here it's Caliph uh, Umar, which is capital U-M-A-R, uh, Ibn Khattab. And uh, he went from 634 to 644, 10 years. He was 12 years younger than Muhammad. And he, uh, originally, he opposed the idea of Islam. He wasn't really in favor of Muhammad. He didn't really believe Muhammad. He didn't believe the revelations. But then his sister exhorted him, and he finally accepted uh, Islam and, and committed himself. And so he must have really committed himself because he became one of the caliphs. He uh, is the one that conquered Damascus, Alexandria, uh, a place called Isfahan, and Jerusalem as early as 638. So we're talking a short time after uh, Muhammad died. Think about that. We're talking six years, I believe it is, after Muhammad died. And when you think about where Arabia is at, and, and then... Um, He's, they're going all the way to Damascus and conquering Damascus, going westward all the way to Jerusalem and conquering Jerusalem. So they just were spreading out. They were taking this, this warring party that they had and just going all over the place. Um, so I want to just stop a minute or kind of focus for a moment on the idea of them taking Israel. In um, Steve Russellman's book, The First Crusade, he says, uh, quote, the Arabs quickly overran the country, meaning of Israel. The Christian population submitted to them without demur, demur, and the Jews gave them active help. Only at Jerusalem and Caesarea was there any organized resistance. But there was little hope. Um, now, this is really sad. Patriarch uh, Sophronius hastily repaired the defenses of the city. Now, he was a Christian patriarch. The, the Christians were basically there in Jerusalem. They were there in Israel. There were many Christians in Israel at that time. And so the patriarch, the head of Jerusalem at that time, um, Sophronius, uh, basically, you know, he tried to get ready. He saw that the uh, marauders were coming. 
so it goes on, but he carefully sent all of the holy Christian relics with the exception uh, of the true cross for, to, uh, for safety to Constantinople. On February, uh, on a February day in the year 638, that Caliph Umar entered Jerusalem riding upon a camel. He was dressed in worn, filthy robes, and the army that followed him was rough and unkept, but its discipline was perfect. At his side was the patriarch uh, Sophronius as the chief magistrate of the surrendered city. Next, the caliph asked to see the shrines of the Christians. The patriarch took him to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, today, when you go to Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem, this is the entrance to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, it is gigantic in there. You, you get inside, and it doesn't look very big here, but believe me, it's... It's huge, and it, it actually is, was built by um, uh, Constantine's mom, Helena. You know, we have Mount St. Helens. That's where we get Helena from. That's where we get it from. Uh, built it over um, not only where Jesus was crucified, but also over where he was buried. And so this thing is really extensive, and, and you go inside of it, and that's the, the stones that go all the way back there. And, of course, there's been rebuilding of, of it over the generations. I believe this particular structure comes from the 12th century. But it was built over um, Helena's building of it in, the, in 327 A.D., something like that. And some of those stones, those foundation stones, are still there. It's amazing. Um, this goes on. While they were in the church, the hour of Muslim prayer approached. Omar went outside for fear, he said, um, lest his zealous followers might claim for Islam the holiest sanctuary of Christendom. So he actually did uh, Christians a favor because he realized that his followers were so zealous that if, if he knelt down and put his prayer mat there inside of the, you know, of, of the holy church, uh, that, that basically um, it would become a mosque. And, um, and Christians would have a hard time even getting into it. So he actually ran outside so that uh, he would not do it inside, and then he put down his prayer mat, and so thank you very much. Um, now, the formula for, once again, for expansion was Islam, tribute, or sword. And um, the Islamic calendar, he created the Islamic lunar calendar in 638 or 639, it is based upon the lunar cycle rather than solar. The lunar Muslim Hijra, which we talked about before, year is 354 days rather than 365. Does anybody remember why that is? Why is it 354 days as compared to 365? No. Interesting thought, but no. A moon cycle. It's because they use the lunar calendar. They use the lunar calendar. Um, and, and, when, and when basically they took, when they went to, from Mecca to Medina, they called it the Hijra, the Hijra. And um, so this becomes the beginning of the Islamic calendar. And basically it starts when um, the crescent moon of what's called Murharam um, is seen. And, and so every year when this month occurs in Muharram, this is when you're going to have kind of the beginning of it all, uh, the beginning of their calendar. And then he was, Umar was assassinated by a uh, Persian prisoner of war. Okay, I know, I know we're moving quickly here, but uh, any questions? Um, I'm sorry. Yep. Right there, Hijra. Okay. Um, that's okay. If you missed something, just let me know. So, um, Caliph Uthman, from 644 to 656, he was six years younger than Muhammad and the fifth person to accept Islam. He was Muhammad's son-in-law, and he married two of Muhammad's daughters. Uh, he was considered generous because he funded Muhammad's battles. And he basically, I mean, if you look at this now, there is the Arabian Peninsula. Look how far north it goes, 
how far west and how far east. It went all the way to China, went all the way to China, uh, which is crazy, by 656. So we're just talking a few decades after the time of Muhammad. They are just spreading out, and people were not ready for war back then. And, you know, and they, and they were organized, so they had warriors and they had a cause. And so they moved forward. Uh, he, okay, um, he codified um, the Quran. So he, he's known for the codification of the Quran. Now, many believe that the Quran actually was not codified until 100 years later, really put together in a systematic or any kind of systematic order, even though it seems very confusing to us. But he started the idea anyway of getting all of those things put together. And, um, but then he made a mistake of promoting his own relatives to positions of power. And so he was assassinated by Muslims, by uh, Egyptians, I believe it was. And um, this quote from uh, a Muslim named uh, Rakiyad Maksud in Teach Yourself Islam says, Uthman gained a bad reputation for promoting his own relatives to positions of power, and ultimately he died at the hands of the Egyptians. His wife, uh, Nela, tried to protect him, but her fingers were actually cut off in the fight. She sent her dismembered appendages along with a plea for help to Uthman's cousin, Mu Muila, uh, the governor of Damascus in Syria. Okay, now, before we get into talking about Ali, this is, this is going to be where we're going to see the split start to happen between the Sunni and the Shia. So I'm just quoting from my book here on page 81, Allah weeps, the split between what would eventually become known as the divide between Sunni and Shia Muslims began to emerge just 24 years after Muhammad's death, uh, 656 to 661, when Ali, Muhammad's cousin, and son-in-law finally staked a claim to be the rightful successor of the prophet. So we see Caliph Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he was the first child supposedly to accept Islam sometime after um, Khadijah. And of course he was related to Muhammad. He was the cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, and um, he was married to Fatima. So in the blank there you write the name Fatima, F-A-T-I-M-A, -A, Fatima. And he, pro he proclaimed to be the true heir of Muhammad. Uh, well, some things happened during his reign that uh, there were problems with. Um, there were civil wars. Civil wars is what you write in the blank. So Aisha, Muhammad's wife and daughter of Abu Bakr, was the first caliph and he opposed Ali's nomination to become caliph. Um, so it was the beginning of the split between Shia and Sunni, and Ali was assassinated by rebel warriors from his own troops. So I want to, uh, now we're gonna kind of look at this, uh, look back at the first four caliphs time, um, and, and how it was, mar what, you know, what marked it. So basically, the ideal versus the reality. Um, the original idealistic goal was to create Uma. Everybody say Uma. Uma. Kind of sounds like an African word, Uma. Uh, U-M-M-A-H, a community of Muslims who had social justice, practical compassion, and a distribution of wealth. Um, letter B, it ended in the reality of a community devolved into civil war. And the word is fitna, F-I-T-N-A-H, fitna, F-I-T-N-A-H, in which the caliphate had become a small group of rich men of power who were tyrannical. And so basically, um, it, was not, it was not good for them. Now, in your notes, um, one, two, and three, assassinations of the first four caliphs during that time, three were assassinated. So just thinking about them overall, you know, and their, and their leadership and how they basically ran their kingdom and what a part of their lives was like, you can learn a lot about uh, even a kingdom based upon how the succession went along. So of the first four caliphs during that time, three were assassinated and all were involved in warfare 
and the aggressive expansion of Islam. Number two, rivalry. Both Asia and, uh, remember, Asia was the, was the favorite wife of Muhammad. She was just a girl when she married him, so she's grown up now. Both Asia and uh, Mu Muwilla, the, the governor of Damascus, opposed Ali becoming caliph because he did not seek out those who assassinated Caliph Uthman, making it appear as though he was consenting to it. And then three, greater schism, genuine adherence of the faith became dismayed because the noble side of Islamic teaching, including equality, unity, community, service to Allah, and the spreading of the message were being overshadowed by the baser elements of human greed, power, lust, debauchery, and cruelty. So there was contention breaking out, even in Islam at that time. You had some people that thought, no, this is, this is terrible what we're doing. You know, these, the, we're supposed to be striving for a united community that has peace and and uh, nobility and, and uh, truth seeking and all of this within it. And what have we turned ourselves into here? And so, uh, you know, we, we need to remember that people are people. And so in, in every, you know, great group of people, there's going to be, there's probably going to be schisms like this when it starts to take a wrong turn. And this definitely did. Um, expansion under letter C. Within just two decades after Muhammad's death, the Islamic ar armies had conquered vast swaths of land, from North Africa to the Caucasus Mountains, and in the east beyond Iran to the Oxus River in the present day uh, country of Afghanistan. So they just spread out. I don't know if, the his if in history we've actually ever seen anything else like it. They just, because of their, you know, they used the sword to conquer uh, and spread their religion through the sword. And so basically it was um, very intense. Now, under letter D, radical fundamentalism. Please write that in the blank, fundamentalism. The rewards were plentiful. Uh, the once disunited bands of nomads who had occasionally plundered a caravan now and again had become a united horde of self-seeking, greedy, early Islamic fundamentalists. So, you know, at one time they simply used to go and take caravans. Now they took that same passion and they're just going out into the four corners of the known world at that time. If you look at the timeline in your notes of the early major caliphates, there are different versions of the early Islamic timetable for the caliphates and empires, uh, each with its own emphasis and timeline. And I would probably say each also depending on where they're coming at from it in the world and their interpretation of what took place. Uh, so the following only represents one idea um, uh, that these were the major caliphates that took place. Other people looking back in history might have other ideas. Uh, and we can only examine a few of these, but I put these in here for your understanding that there were kind of major movements happening in the populations of people that considered themselves Muslims at that time and, and breaking out into different avenues of thought, different avenues of, of kingdoms to conquer and, and approaches to take. And, and so, and who was going to be in leadership? You know, who's gonna be the person in power? And how are they gonna compete with one another? And so all of that kind of took place. Uh, but we will look at a few of these. We look at the Umayyad dynasty, which went from 661 to 750. So write the word Umayyad, uh, capital U-M-A-Y-Y-A-D, dynasty. And that went from uh, starting in 661. And uh, we've seen this guy before. He's the one that accused Ali of, of not uh, uh, being true um, to, to the cause of protecting uh, the other caliph. And so uh, Muwilla, Muwiya, it's kind of hard for me to say, seated in Damascus, uh, in, mod in what we call modern Syria, he took control. And Islam moved uh, towards a centralized autocracy. Now, what's important about this is so we've seen the, the first four caliphs in the Rashidun um, caliphate, and they were just kind of all spreading out. They were just going for it. But now we start to see uh, several things happen as we move into the uh, Umayyad dynasty. And 
and it becomes more centralized. It's like, okay, you've got, you've got a center, like a capital, so to speak, and everything's moving out from there. Um, the paradox, the strengthening of the Islamic State preserved the identity and the cohesion of the Islamic community. But as it grew stronger, and this is the paradox, it moved further away from the social and ethical ideas of Islam. So what people thought was a noble cause there, when it was small, as it got large and it took more ground and more empires, it started to disintegrate. And all of that kind of went away, according to some scholars. Um, so from page 82 in my book, the initial purpose of the Islamic Caliphate was to uh, serve the cause and to spread the message of Islam. In reality, however, the Caliphate ended up serving the purposes of a small group of rich, powerful men who essentially ruled by tyranny. When uh, Muiya took control in 661, Islam took another step toward empowering a centralized autocracy which continued to drain the influence of the Islamic community. And so now, at, in the beginning, the capital of Islam uh, was in Mecca. And you see where Mecca is at there in Arabia, but now everything has moved north. And so it has moved up to other areas, and, and this is becoming the center now of, of the Islamic world and where the control is taking place. And what we see moving forward now over the centuries of time is that the, basically the, the center of the Islamic world, where the major caliphate is at and where it is dominating Islam, moves all over the place depending on who is in control, who has the most power, who can dominate others by military force, is basically the way that it works. Um, even up to the present day, where we saw ISIS trying to take control of a large swath of land in the last few years, and this was their goal, that they basically would have a stronghold and that, and that Saudi Arabia and all of the others in, in the world uh, that, you know, our, our Muslim states would have to submit to them. Any questions? All right. Um, so moving on with this, in, under letter C there, in 691, they, they uh, built the, the Dome of the Rock. And so this is something that happened, which is, uh, you know, very monumental for all three religions, uh, which we will talk about in a moment. Now, I actually have a video here made up of, of, of photos and a little video. But what you see here is the, is the Wailing Wall. And this is the Jews, the closest that the Jews can get to the rock that is under the Dome of the Rock which to them is the most holy place in the whole world because that's where Abraham was going to sacrifice um, Isaac at. So they are forbidden uh, to go up to that rock. So this is the closest they can get, which is um, the Wailing Wall. It's the Western Wall, and it is built by Herod a long, long time ago. And you know when the Romans came in, they destroyed Jerusalem, but parts of it were left. And so this is from the Second Temple era. And so they go there, they go up to the wall, they put prayers in the wall. Sometimes there will be thousands, tens of thousands of them in there, uh, you know, doing their, their prayers and, and, and wailing and going up into the wall and putting a little prayer into the wall. Um, we always, you know, put prayers into the wall when we go there. Now we're moving up to what's called the Temple Mount in the, in the slides here. And so on top is this is all restricted now to the Jews because the Jews gave it back to um, the Muslims in the uh, Six Day War um, that took place, I believe it was 1967. And uh, the Jews just kind of wiped out the Arabs as they came in, but they wanted to have peace with them. So they gave them basically control of what's called the Temple Mount. And then immediately the, the, um, the Muslims said to the Jews, okay, you cannot come up here. So once again, you have the Wailing Wall because the Jews can only get to that certain place. And the only ones that can really go up there are ones that are given a special privilege uh, by uh, the, the Islamic uh, group that you know, is over that part of it, um, has control of it. So 
Uh, but, but that dome of the rock, that dome that you see there, that gold dome and that entire building was built once again in 691 over the rock that is supposedly the place where Abraham was going to sacrifice. It's pretty cool, you guys. I, I, last time I was there, I was in Bethlehem, and you learn something every time you go there. And the, and the tour guide pointed a, a mountain out to me, and he said, that is the mountain that tradition says that Abraham stood on uh, when, he was, when he was traveling, when God had told him to take Abraham, uh, take Isaac, and, and he, looked, he looked and he saw Mount Moriah. He saw the mount uh, where he was supposed to go, where God wanted him to go. And so that was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, now, the Islamic armies conquered all of North Africa as well as the country of Spain. And Spain would remain um, under their domination until 1492, 700 years later, when the terrible Spanish Inquisition expelled Islam. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, in that, Christians did things that they shouldn't have done. Uh, but that was in 1492. You can see how big of an area um, is Islam at that time. And then... And then also a part of that was um, a part of that in the in the northern area there of Africa, uh, right up here. It's kind of hard to point. It's not quite long enough. But on the Mediterranean coast and in the northern part of Africa is is Tunisia, where actually um, the fourth most holy mosque in the world was was built. And I have uh, a little video of it here. It's not very long. But I had the privilege of going there with some friends. Um, and, and some of these individuals are with uh, a mission organization that uh, basically targets um, Islam. They, they go into countries in, in the way of business and they basically um, e try to evangelize. But they, but they do it by friendship evangelism. Uh, there's nothing that is just, you know, outspoken. They simply get to know people and then they... They uh, become friends, and, and these people have been there for, for years. Um, great, wonderful people. I went and visited them not too long ago. Uh, and then one was from another place um, in the UAE um, doing the same type of work in um, the United Arab Emirates. Um, okay, moving along here. Um, under letter E, uh, we see... The Church of St. John in Damascus taken over and the Greek replaced by Arabic. Um, number one, Islam was becoming more hostile towards Christianity and the people of other faiths. There were controversies. The Shiite uh, revolutions uh, were continuing to evolve. And um, a group called the Mawalis, uh, which were converts to Islam, felt resentful and like second-class citizens, especially if they were not Arabic. And then... Uh, as the invaders move forth, the Islamic marauders, uh, through one territory to another, um, the only real successful battle at that time was when Charles Martel um, stood against them. His army of 30,000 defeated an army of 80,000. So it was a significant victory for Europe um, and the Christians, so to speak, against um, Islam coming in. And then in, under letter H, in your notes, you see um, the Umayyad uh, Caliph Masur II was defeated in Iraq by Abdullah, a direct descendant of the Prophet's uncle Abbas. Um, and then I think something that's very interesting. Um, oh, that's where Charles Martel was at, right there. In um, Yeah. Uh, there was... At the time that Islam was moving forward, there started to emerge this belief that Islam represented the fifth trumpet of, um, of, of the book of Revelation. And so I want to read that to you. And I'm, I'm just going to flip to the book of Revelation here very quickly. If you have a Bible, you can open up to it. And there are people in the world that hold to this day that Islam represents the fifth trumpet um, in the book of Revelation. And so I want to bring that to your knowledge. Uh, starting in verse 1 of chapter 9, Then the fifth angel sounded, 
And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Uh, verse four, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any bird, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were uh, given the authority to kill them, but to, tor but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of the scorpion when it strikes a man. Verse six, in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. So verse 7, basically, um, they would yell, wear yellow turbans, uh, many of them. And so uh, some people matched verse 7 to the idea that they wore yellow turbans. And verse 8, they had hair like a woman's hair, and their teeth were like uh, uh, a lion's teeth. Verse 9, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sounds of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. Well, when you look at the crescent moon, it looks like a scorpion's tail. And so basically people... Uh, took these images uh, of what was talked about there, the fierce ho horsemen wearing uh, beards and, and long hair like women's and yellow turbans and iron coats. Uh, and, and this idea of the scorpion's tail, they thought that maybe this was the fifth trumpet. So just for your understanding. Now we move on into the Abbasid dynasty. Caliph Abdallah rules from Baghdad, which is in modern day Iraq the Abbasid, A-B-B-A-S-I-D, uh, dynasty. And he gained control of northern India at that time. From uh, my book on page 84, the Abbasid faction capitalized on a widespread desire to see a descendant of Muhammad leading the new religion of Islam. In 750, the last Umayyad caliph, Masur II, was defeated in Iraq. I already read that, sorry. Um, and then some marked improvements. There were more equal opportunities. Write that in the blank. There were more equal opportunities among mu Muslims, not just Arab Muslims. So some things were getting a little bit better. Uh, with the advent of the new dynasty, some things in Islamic society improved, while others got worse. The traditional privilege of birth and race gradually gave way to more equal opportunities for all Muslims, not just Arab Muslims. Commerce and the marketplace grew in both productivity and status. The streets of Baghdad, the new capital of the dynasty, bustled with business activity. And so you can see how widespread now uh, the Abbasid is. The yellow is the direct rule of the Abbasid dynasty. Um, and then these other colors are in, in, in relationship to the Abbasid dynasty, um, if not directly a part of it. They were all kind of under it in a way. Okay. So I want you to look at letter E there. In 800 to 850, um, Sufism started to emerge. And this was a mystical Islamic sect. Now, we're going to talk more about that later on. But basically, there are three parts of Islam today. You have, you have the Sunni, number one. They are the largest in the world. Um, roughly 80 to 85% of the Islamic world is Sunni. You have the Shia, which, you know, depending on what estimates you're looking at, they could be 15 to even 20%. But somewhere in there, there is a marginal group, maybe 1 or 2%, that are called the Sufi. And they basically are kind of like the truth seekers. Um, they are, in a sense, some just think they're basically mystical, uh, but they are the ones that write poetry. Uh, they may get, might, got caught, might get caught up in the occultic ideas a little bit more than others. But they started to emerge at that time and to grow. You know, there were people that just didn't like war. 
in any way or another. And they said, you know, there's got to be another answer here. And so they started seeking other ideas. You can, just reading along there, you can see that the Muslims actually sacked Rome and the Vatican in 856. Um, in 935, you had um, the future caliphs of Damascus were forced to accept warlords. Um, in 1254, the last of the empire fell when the Mughal leader, notice this, Hulagu Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, sacked Damascus. So the Khans, and I go into this in my book, but basically um, they meant, some of them were actually impacted by Christianity. Uh, probably the, one of the reasons that uh, Rome didn't suffer a worse defeat is because, because the Khans had, had somewhat submitted to Christianity, some of them. Uh, but then Islam uh, kind of took control. They came in and they merged with Islam and it, it was pretty um, messy. And of course, there's a lot of different history back and forth. And then finally, um, looking at this section six, uh, perspectives about origins. Under letter A, the, the, an individual's particular worldview shapes how they view things like origins. If either a Christian or a Muslim was asked how the universe began, the answer might likely be that God created it. Yet if the question are about the origins of Islam, a Christian and Muslim might answer very differently because of worldview and teaching. For instance, consider the following questions with likely answers by a Christian or a Muslim. When did religion, uh, the religion of Islam begin? A Christian would probably answer in the seventh century. I certainly would. Um, but a Muslim might say it has always existed because they believe that Abraham was a Muslim, don't you know? Um, and number two, where did it begin? Where did Islam begin? Well, for us, it began in Arabia. Today, it would be called Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Muslim would say it began with God in heaven. Um, who started the religion? Well, we would say Muhammad, but they would say God started it. And how did Islam spread and develop? Uh, we would say by preaching and the sword, um, but, the, but the Muslim would say by divine revelation and intervention from God. Now, let's see. We have just a couple minutes left. So I want to go to the question corner there. And um, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2. And verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And then quickly over in chapter 8, um, we see um, how Philip um, went down to Samaria. It starts in verse 1 with, with Paul, and, and, or Saul, who was called Saul at that time. It talks about the persecution and how they were scattered, the Christians were scattered, um, the only ones that stayed in um, Jerusalem were the apostles at that time. And then going down to verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip, now this is Philip the deacon, not Philip the, the apostle, Philip the deacon, one of the seven, um, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he, had, he did, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed uh, and lame were healed and there was great joy in the city. And so questions, how did people hear about the message of Christ? And I'd like a kind of a verbal response. How did they hear about the message of Christ? So preaching went forth. Preaching went forth, okay? I, I know these are simple answers, but... I think it's just good to remind ourselves. Um, number two, how were Christians treated by those who did not like their message? 
Not very nice. Like, like what not? Imprisonment specifically. Death specifically. That's right. Uh, number three, what miraculous acts accompanied Philip's preaching? Healing. Unclean spirits were cast out. Uh, miracles were taking place. And so it all leads up to question number four. What is the difference of how Christianity and Islam spread their message? Big differences, right? Opposites. You know? Not by the sword. That's number one. Not by the sword. The beginning, the sword of the spirit. Thank you. The beginnings of Christianity were, were uh, not about, um, you know, a barbaric going out with a sword and just killing people. It was about, I mean, Christians even gave up their lives um, to spread the gospel. Okay, um, let's take a break now, and we'll meet back here in 10 minutes.